Hello and welcome to the 12th uh, episode of the webinar series on global, re global crisis, global risk and uh, global consequences from the Geneva Center for Security Policy, GCSB. The GCSB is an international nonprofit foundation physically based in Geneva, Switzerland, comprised of uh, 53 states of which all permanent member of uh, the UN Security Council. My name is Jean-Marc Rickley. I'm the head of Global Risk and Resilience at the GCSP. The GCSP mission is to promote peace and international security, to prepare and transform individuals and organizations so they can create a safe world. We are impartial, independent, and inclusive. We achieve these, our objective through executive education, research, public discussion, as well as innovative uh, fellowship program for executive in transition. Our community has grown significantly over the last few years and now reached more than 8,200 uh, influential alumni around 165 uh, uh, nations. When we started this uh, webinar series 12 uh, weeks ago, Coronavirus uh, was approaching 1 million infections worldwide and there were almost uh, 48,000 uh, deaths. This week, we have more than uh, 8.3 uh, million infections, which is more than 8.4 times what we had 12 weeks ago, and more than 449,000 deaths worldwide, which is more than 9.35 uh, uh, than uh, 12 weeks ago, of which more than 100, um, 117,000 deaths in the United uh, States. As you can see, uh, the uh, coronavirus uh, is uh, far uh, from uh, slowing down and uh, it's continuing its uh, growth uh, worldwide. But the growth has shifted uh, from Europe to the United States to now South and Latin America. And maybe in the future, uh, we'll see uh, a growth in Africa. At least it's the topic of uh, today, about looking at the impact of the COVID-19 on Africa. We uh, have a very distinguished panel uh, today to discuss um, the impact of COVID-19 in Africa. First, we'll have uh, Dr. John Gengasong. He's the director of the Africa Center for Disease Control and Prevention a very important organization in Africa, the leading organization um, dealing with uh, uh, the coronavirus crisis. He will talk about the overview of the public health impact of COVID-19 on Africa and the continent response. Then we'll have Dr. Gervais Rufikiri. He's a former vice president of Burundi and is now a executive, uh, GCSP executive in residence uh, fellow. He will talk about uh, reflections of COVID-19 and Burundi. Then we'll have uh, Ms. Uh, Mousi Shigun. She's the Executive Director of Human Rights Watch Africa Division. She will talk about recent human rights and governance impact of COVID-19 on Africa. Then we'll have Ms. Susan Stigant. She's Director of the Africa Programs at the United States Institute of Peace uh, in Washington. She will talk about forward-looking impact of COVID-19 on economies and society. And then, uh, Last but not least, Ms. Ralph Mamia. He is a GCSP Executive in Residence Fellow, uh, as well as non-resident advisor to the International Peace uh, Institute and a former UN uh, Department for Peacekeeping Operation uh, uh, civil servant. He will talk about potential ways to find opportunities in crisis. Last week, during a recession on Latin America, we uh, realized that, um, as I mentioned earlier, the center of gravity of the spread of coronavirus has shifted now to emerging um, economies. When we look though at Africa, Africa looks like an exception because um, uh, it has been so far relatively immune from the coronavirus. Africa reported its first case of the novel coronavirus uh, in, uh, on February 15, a full two months after it was first identified in China. 
As of June 18, according to the Africa Center for Disease Control and Prevention, there are 267,519 cases, 7,197 deaths, and 122,661 recoveries in Africa. According to the Africa Center for Strategic Studies, it, uh, the, the coronavirus has been now reported in all 54 uh, countries in Africa. 10 countries in Africa are currently responsible for nearly 80% of all infection, with 70% of death taking place in only five countries, Algeria, Egypt, Nigeria, South Africa, and Sudan. The slow rate of the dissemination of the coronavirus is linked to a host of factors. Uh, the early spread of the pandemic in many African countries was driven by foreigners and the economic elite, people from Europe and those with the means to travel to Europe. Most African uh, nations stayed, uh, stayed off the initial spread of the virus for several months, partly by closing early uh, their borders, banning public gathering, and in some countries, effectively tracing contact using past experiences of infectious disease. South Africa led the way by closing its border to high-risk travelers and shutting its schools in mid-March before reaching 100 confirmed cases, as street London was then swiftly imposed. Health experts say that this tough decision and the long experience dealing with the diseases like Ebola and yellow fever made a significant uh, impact on transmission rates. Other key factors are relative to uh, the movements of population across the continent with sparse world networks and largely rural population in some regions, the, the virus may, may have fewer opportunities to travel. Climatic factors like weather and precipitation could also have played a role. One clear advantage across Africa is based on the makeup of the population itself, more than 70% uh, 70 percent of people living in sub-saharan africa are under 30 and we know that the coronavirus is uh, affecting uh, elderly more severely lifestyle condition also such as diabetes hypertension and obesity which are important comorbidities for the coronavirus um, also led to fewer uh, severe cases in many african countries so if we look at that, Africa managed to deal quite well with the crisis at the beginning. It took 98 days uh, for Africa to have 100,000 confirmed cases. Yet, the World Health Organization said last week that confirmed cases in Africa has doubled in 18 days to reach now more than 200,000 uh, cases. Even though these cases in Africa account for less than 3% uh, of the global total, it is clear that this pandemic is accelerating. To make the matter worse, testing is still extremely limited in most African countries, so it is impossible to know how widely the pandemic has taken hold. And now that many African countries, like others across the globe, are lifting the restriction in order to restart the economies, the virus has the opportunity to spread and potentially to overwhelm healthcare system characterized by a shortage of protective equipment and healthcare professions. Economic impacts uh, uh, will uh, probably follow due to the reprioritization of national expenditure towards controlling COVID-19 and affecting allocation of resources to other sectors. Tourism is also heavily impacted. Remittances uh, will have a critical impact on a monetary system and household consumption. The reduced flows of hard currencies and the ability of uh, households to purchase uh, essential commodities will also be impacting, as well as the global uh, impact for uh, 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 sorry research, recessionary trends at the global level and the potential for a prolonged reduction of economic growth in China will also have a direct impact on Africa. So to discuss all these very uh, important uh, issues and topic, uh, we will uh, uh, move straight to our first speaker, uh, Dr. John uh, Gengasak. Thank, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Jean-Marc, for, uh, first of all, for inviting. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you <clears throat> so much for the opportunity to contribute uh, on your program. And also, uh, congratulations for the, the very uh, um, accurate summary of the situation of COVID-19 on the continent. I will um, divide my remarks into three. One is just to complement what you have said. Uh, secondly, describe for you very briefly 
uh, our continental response strategy, and then thirdly, where we think we should be uh, focusing and um, as <clears throat> as a continent, as and in the spirit of global solidarity, and then hopefully do that in the eight minutes that you um, uh, encourage us to to stay within that frame. So first of all, uh, to uh, I think our pandemic is what I characterize as a delayed pandemic. So Africa uh, has not been spared of this. It's just it been a delayed pandemic as we as you rightly uh, described, Jean Marc. Just to give you some, put the numbers that you put you 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 you, you put out there in the context. Uh, if you compare last week and this week, we are up by 28 percent of new cases, and um, that translates to 57,000 cases. It took us forever to get to 50,000, but uh, just within a week, we are now uh, reaching uh, hitting 57,000. Our daily numbers are now around 8,000 per day. Okay, and all of that has to be put in the context of a challenge in testing. Uh, we are making very good progress, uh, but it was very difficult to get the testing going on the continent for several reasons. I think that is clear. If you do not test, as I've always maintained, you don't find. If you test, you find. So I think. Um, we have to take our numbers then in the appropriate context of our the challenge we've had over the years, uh, over the, the sorry last couple of months. Now I just want to be clear that uh, it, it is not because Africa doesn't know how to test. I think if there's a continent that knows how to test a lot, it, HIV, TB, malaria, and other diseases, is Africa because we test more than 120 million. Uh, we conduct more than 120 million tests um, a, a, a year for HIV. Um, I think that that has to be uh, put in that context of we may not truly be having the full picture of our pandemic because of this limited testing. When, uh, as you already said, the continent was uh, knew that this threat was imminent, we reacted quickly as a continent at the level of the African Union Commission at the, the level of the, the, the leadership of, of, of different countries, where we convene a meeting is, is precisely on February 22nd, at the, uh, under the leadership of Chairperson Musa Faki, uh, the, the Chair of the African Union Commission, we're bringing all ministers of health together, and we had a, a full day discussion on, strat uh, on strategies. At the end of that, we endorsed as a continent, a continental strategy and also a task force. The continental strategy uh, call on three things for us to focus on uh, limiting transmission, limiting uh, uh, deaths, and limiting uh, harm. And harm here was used very broadly, which included the harm on the economy, the financial systems, and across the spectrum, the human rights components, as well as um, the harm to other non-COVID related diseases. We did this because we borrowed lessons from the West Africa Ebola outbreak. And, and then, of course, the, um, the, the, the ongoing uh, Ebola outbreak in, in DRC, where we recognize that in West Africa, a lot of the 11,000 people who died of, uh, of Ebola, of course, were directly affected or infected by Ebola. But there were many other deaths that were due to Ebola, not because of Ebola, which is the HIV deaths, the malaria deaths, and other uh, diseases there. So I think recognizing that. Uh, to leave the 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 the, the, um, court, uh, the sorry the continental strategy, we said it will be underpinned by four things: the ability to communicate across member states, ability to coordinate effectively, ability to uh, cooperate and collaborate. So those were the four underpinning of what the continental strategy would do in order to meet the three technical arms that I described. So um, under the leadership of of, of uh, President Ramaphosa, who is the current chair of the African Union. Uh, so there's the African Union Commission, and then there's the African Union. Uh, he has been doing a remarkable job where we, uh, they hit at the highest level of the, the continent, at the presidential level, they have been meeting regularly. Nearly our last meeting was last Thursday, and uh, about 15 head of states will come together on the the, the, the leadership of President Amaposa to discuss strategies. And, and he named special invoices for economy invoices, about five of them. And they, this, uh, we all come together to coordinate, discuss ways to look at the strat continental strategy, not just the herd component, but also the financial implication that he has uh, on our economies there. 
I think that has been then uh, uh, driven actively by the Africa CDC driving the task force, working closely with WHO and to drive uh, the task force, the technical task force that has about seven different components, including laboratory surveillance, and as well as um, uh, 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 risk communication and, and uh, infection control and prevention. So remarkable progress done. I mean, just as I indicated here, when the, the in January, end of January, there was absolutely no laboratory in Africa that had the reagents to test for COVID. I mean, I, I use the word reagents deliberately because people say the ability to test. I mean, it's not the ability to test, but it's the lack of the reagents. So I think, uh, but then by end of March, we had ruled that quickly, uh, pulled countries together and provided them with what I call competency-based uh, uh, training, and they were able to uh, uh, be ready for, for, for testing for COVID. Interestingly, the first cases of COVID that showed up on the continent were all picked up by those that we are trained in Senegal or South Africa, and then it gave, it gave them what I call the startup kit. Now, if you look back just five months ago, it looks like five years, but it was just five months ago that we all, what countries were looking for was, was 100 tests, okay, just to be ready to, to do the test, their first cases there, 100. That's all we're looking for to be, man, now we're talking of millions of tests and the needs of that. Let me just conclude then by saying that where we are with our pandemic, uh, we need to uh, endorse the strategy that we have launched. Uh, we call that the partnership to accelerate COVID testing, which is underpinned by the ability to test, scale up testing, the ability to trace those who are infected uh, on their contacts, isolate them, and the ability to provide, make provisions for, for treatment. And I think um, that is the strategy that uh, uh, we, uh, the chairperson of the African Union Commission launched. And they have some very specific targets. We are saying that in the next two to three months, our testing should move from about 3 million to over uh, 10 to 20 million if we have to get catch up with the pandemic. We are saying that we have to have a platform that will allow for easy access to commodities. That has been launched last Thursday at the meeting of head of states. And in the next few hours, President Ramaphosa will be live. Um, uh, I'll be joining him and others to talk about the platform. It's a continental platform. And then we are saying that we need to, as a continent, deploy about well, uh, the one million community healthcare workers, the foot soldiers that will help in contact tracing. I think that's the way forward. Uh, Mark, uh, John Mark, I would like to, at this point, uh, I've used seven minutes. I would like to yield back to you my remaining one minute. Over. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, John, for uh, highlighting uh, the, the current situation and basically showing uh, how swift African reaction uh, woes and uh, the challenges that uh, you, you face now, especially when it comes to uh, state testing and scaling up uh, testing, tracing, uh, um, isolating people and uh, making a provision for a patient is very important. And you mentioned your four C strategies of communicating, coordinating, cooperating and collaborating. Looks like it has uh, worked uh, quite well uh, so far. Uh, we'll probably return to uh, these issues uh, with uh, the other speakers. Before I move to the next speaker, Gervais, I would just uh, like to remind our viewers that, that you have the, the opportunity to uh, ask questions to uh, the speaker by using uh, the Q&A tab. Please uh, ask your question and then my colleague Ashley is collecting them. And at the end of the presentation, we will move into a round of uh, Q&A. Gervais? Uh, would you like to take over? Okay. Thank you, uh, Jean-Marc, for uh, this uh, event on Africa with uh, this problem of uh, COVID. Uh, my presentation will focus on uh, Burundi as a case study uh, to illustrate what the previous speaker was uh, uh, giving as information. Uh, particularly, I will talk about what we know to date about COVID in Burundi, uh, what is the response of uh, the government of Burundi, and what is the current impact of uh, this pandemic. Uh, what do we know to date about COVID in Burundi? First, the exact date of uh, the first case of COVID contamination is unknown. 
uh, little information was uh, circulated at the start of the pandemic uh, because the government did not take the threat seriously. At the outbreak of COVID pandemic, uh, in particular uh, with its spread in the East Africa, uh, the government of Burundi has claimed that Burundi would be an exception under the protection of God. Uh, it was only uh, on the 27th of March that the doctor, a uh, director of a private hospital in the capital Bujumbura, had uh, Wister Brown, after his hospital had received patients uh, suspected for COVID-19 for three weeks. It was in letter he addressed to the Minister of Health. Since then, figures from uh, official sources are a total of uh, 100, around 100 cases of uh, contamination, of which 75 uh, recovered and one died. However, the actual data are more higher than those from official sources. Myself, I have friends who confirm that their relatives have died of COVID-19, and there are many. Second, um, health infrastructure in Burundi, uh, healthcare infrastructure in Burundi, have low technical capacities to deal efficiently with the pandemic. The Iraq uh, reagent products for tests and the Iraq also, also equipment for the treatment of patients. Consequently, no tests, no information on the extent of the pandemic cases, and no measures to protect people in contact with patients. Moreover, in the absence of appropriate equipment, most of the victims die. Gervais, we, we, we have some issue understanding uh, clearly what you said. Do you have a, a microphone by any chance that you could put maybe closer to your mouth? Um, Let me try it. These things happened. Is it better? I uh, try to go ahead and. Uh... Yeah, is it better now? I think it is better. Yes. Ah, okay, okay. Uh, yes. Um, uh, do you want me to repeat something, or uh, you... could you maybe just resume at uh, your second point? Uh, Health. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, second, I was uh, saying that. The health care infrastructure in Burundi is of low capacity to deal with the, uh, this pandemic uh, because there is no uh, reagent products for test or equipment for uh, treatment of uh, patients. And so as there is no test, no information on the extent of the pandemic cases, so no media to protect people in contact with the patients. And moreover, in the absence of appropriate uh, equipment, most of the victims die at home, and consequently, it is impossible to have reliable data or no victims, no statistics. And third, uh, the people have live in fear of uh, something they don't know enough, they don't have enough information, and of which they don't see the exit. Uh, talking about uh, the response of the uh, government uh, from human rights and the governance uh, perspectives, uh, the response of the government uh, is bad since the beginning of the pandemic. It has not been uh, transparent. There has been an excessive obstruction of information about the extent of the COVID contamination. Local actors and the media are forbidden to talk and communicate about the pandemic. 
this is a, uh, a violation of human rights principles, uh, particularly uh, on the freedoms related to information. Uh, some measures have been taken by the government, but they are not enough. Also, uh, the enforcement is uh, insufficient. Uh, an example is that uh, on May uh, 6th uh, of this year, the newspaper Le Figaro uh, wrote in Burundi, the president relies on God to counter the pandemic, the epidemic of coronavirus. Another thing to say is the deterioration of relationship between Burundi and the WHO. Serious divergences led to Burundian government to declare the representatives of this UN organization persona non grata in the middle of May. Similarly, the representative of World Health Organization in Equatorial Guinea was also asked to leave the country early in this June. So the problem is not only in Burundi, it's about the relationship between uh, local government and the international community. Such isolation uh, of the government of the country is a big challenge to the international solidarity and support to the COVID-19 responses. Uh, the last point I would like to, uh, to give my comment is to, on the impact of COVID on security and governance in Burundi. Two elements to mention. The first one is that COVID in Burundi is a real threat for health of the people. For example, the minister, the minister of Health himself has been treated in Kenya for COVID-19, but in Burundi, no official information about that. At the end of May, the first lady of Burundi was airlifted to Nairobi in Kenya for emergency care and was tested positive, COVID positive according to uh, newspapers and uh, the information from, uh, uh, from Kenya. But in Burundi, no information about that. And when he, she went to the airport, uh, the light for the airport was uh, switched off avoid that people could see her uh, uh, leaving the country. Two weeks after, uh, his husband, the late president of Burundi, died on 8th of June, it's June. In its uh, official announcement of the death, the government stated that uh, he died from a cardiac arrest after two days in a uh, hospital but they hide the real cause of the rapid deterioration in his health, uh, which opened the door to speculation, including the death by COVID. The second one is that the government took advantage of uh, COVID to strengthen its isolation. For example, the government rejected the request of the East African community for electoral observers during the, the general elections, which took place in May this year. And the elections were, were uh, not credible, uh, credible, and several serious irregularities uh, have been denounced by independent local observers from the Catholic Church. From the economic perspective, uh, the isolation of Burundi will worsen uh, the already difficult economic situation of the Burundians. The collapse of the economy following the crisis, which started in 2015, has pushed the Burundi behind all nations as the poorest country in the world. So to conclude, 
Burundi is a typical case of uh, country, among countries where the leadership has been unethical or uh, ineffective in the management of the pandemic. And if uh, uh, serious measures are not taken, I think the situation could be tough in uh, the uh, coming uh, weeks or months. Uh, uh, thank you for uh, your attention. Thank you very much, Gervais. So you you presented quite a bleak picture of the situation in uh, Burundi, where you highlighted that um, many cases have not been uh, reported, and this has to do with, on the one hand, uh, social issues. People are mostly staying at home and dying at home and as not reporting. But uh, also uh, the the problem of the transfer of information, the um, the use of this information also from uh, the government, the lack of transparency uh, by uh, the government, and overall this leads to uh, making uh, weakening actually uh, uh, Burundi. We might uh, return to that probably in the question and uh, answer. Uh, then our next speaker, Miss um, uh, Mosi. Uh, Shigun, the mic is yours. Thank you. Thanks, Jean Marc, and um, thank you, GCSP, for having me here. Um, I hope you can hear me well. Um, yeah. Could you please just either speak up or uh, speak closer to the mic, maybe? Okay, is this, uh, is this any yeah. better? That, that's much okay. better, yes, thank you. Okay, great. Um, so, I mean, I, I, my, I'm going to focus on uh, human rights and um, issues of governance around um, the response from many governments across Africa. Um, and so as we, we've heard, you know, through as they, they, the spread of the virus reached Africa months behind other regions, um, perhaps should have given African countries the opportunity to prepare. Um, and But as Dr. John said, a lot was done to make sure that was in place, but um, a number of issues uh, and existing challenges made the response difficult. However, the, this, the, the many governments, um, at least 45 um, sub-Saharan African countries, have invoked emergency powers to enforce um, mandatory quarantines and um, isolation restriction of movements and social distancing to slow down the spread of the virus. Um, now we have looked at um, the situation, especially around um, the government response, uh, using a framework of five intersectional areas to monitor the application of emergency powers and um, implementation of um, some of these measures. The first area that we have um, looked at is access to information and technology. Um, here we are focused on in, how, in, how governments are ensuring that people have information they need um, about the virus, including through the internet. Um, in Ethiopia, for example, we warned um, very early on, um, on the, the, at the onset of the, the spread of the disease in Africa, that the then three month long government shutdown of the internet in Western Oromia, um, where an insurgency um, uh, uh, operation is ongoing, violated multiple rights and could have deadly consequences for um, the health of the people there. Um, the government has since restored telecom services in the region, um, but this is an issue that we're monitoring very closely across um, Africa. Um, we have seen attempts to use emergency powers to curtail media, media freedom in, in Somalia and um, in Rwanda, where several journalists have been arrested beaten and detained for criticizing government's response and for reporting on complaints. Um, we have also highlighted how misinformation, especially by government officials, can undermine efforts to limit the spread of the virus. Um, we've done this in, in, in Tanzania and of course, uh, as uh, Gervais just presented in Burundi, um, where the government um, has refused to acknowledge the threat that the disease presents um, with claims of um, national exceptionalism. Um, the government also PNG pers uh, declared personal non grata and expelled the WHO country representative uh, and three of its experts. Um, however, health workers in Bujumbura 
um, um, have told us that they are concerned that the, the tests are not being carried out. Um, and then on the other hand, they are continuing to record an increase in the number of deaths and suspected cases coming into the hospitals. They are worried that the government's messaging around the virus will mean that people would not seek treatment and that many more could die. Um, the second um, area we are monitoring is in the application of containment measures for people in custody. Um, this includes people in prisons, uh, detention centers, um, and uh, closed institutions such as for older people, people with disabilities, and survivors of gendered violence. Um, we're also seeing an increase in cases of women stuck in violent domestic situations, unable to get help because of the restrictions of movement. Now, in terms of prisons, um, with up to 70% of um, inmates in prisons across Africa in pretrial detention, most of the prisons across the continent are overcrowded. Um, of course, this makes social distancing and self-isolation virtually impossible. For example, in Cameroon, um, which has one of the worst prison population densities in Africa, um, we have advocated for release of pretrial detainees, particularly nonviolent offenders like political prisoners and people who are at the you know, latter end of um, serving out their sentences. Um, and you know, we, we were very you know, gratified to see that um, beginning from April 15, the government of um, Cameroon began to release some of these categories of detainees to curb the, the diseases spread and has so far released over 1,300 people. Similar releases are also being implemented in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, in Rwanda, Uganda, and South Africa. Um, the third area that we focus on is um, my, on migration. Um, we, they, on, for this, we, we're looking at asylum seekers, migrants, refugees, internally displaced people, um, in, in conflict situations such as we have in South Sudan, in Northeast Nigeria and the Sahel, we have raised concerns about the challenges of providing adequate health and sanitation services, including clean water, and um, the, of course, the practice of social distancing in these large and overcrowded refugee camps, um, as well as um, informal settlements for internally displaced people and formal camps. Um, we've raised concerns that many migrants and asylum seekers, for example, in South Africa, are being excluded in the provision of um, some of the palliative economic measures, um, including food aid um, and other services. Um, many of these asylum seekers and migrants are lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people um, who have fled to South Africa to escape persecution in their home countries. Uh, as you may know, um, 33 out of the 70 countries around the world that criminalize adult consensual same-sex conduct are in Africa. And so many look to South Africa as a place of refuge. Um, we have called on the authorities to address um, this challenge um, for this um, category of people. Um, we're also documenting incidents of COVID-19 related um, discrimination and hate crimes, um, frequently targeting um, Asian migrants in some African countries, um, as well as on the other on the other side of the world, discriminatory and xenophobic treatment of Africans in um, some parts of China. Um, the, the the fourth area we 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 we're focusing on is on poverty and inequality. Our concern our concern is that the lockdowns are especially punishing for low income earners and people um, in informal sectors. Um, who already live in the economic margins, um, mostly in large urban slums and informal settlements across most cities in Africa. Um, in South Africa, we, we, we recorded that security forces used rubber bullets and water cannons to disperse homeless people who are lining up for food, um, telling them to go home when they had no home to go to. Um, Ugandan and Kenyan authorities have forcefully quarantined travelers at airports and, um, you know, and, and also people who are alleged to have flouted curfews have been, you know, punitively asked to either pay for a mandatory four day, 14 days self-isolation in government designated hotels at amounts that are excessive for most or uh, most um, um, Ugandans and Kenyans, um, or for them to stay in unsanitary 
and ill-equipped isolation centers, thus you know, compounding the problems um, and the capacity of those centers with people who have no business being there. Um, some countries, including Nigeria, Rwanda, and South Africa, um, have introduced some social and economic safety nets to mitigate the negative effects um, of these measures, um, but they have faced huge challenges in ensuring that they are equitable and efficient, um, as I've mentioned in the example of LGBT people and migrants um, in South Africa. Um, we, the, the recognition of this, um, some of those tough measures are, are that, that, that the, the measures are harming not just the poor, but, not, but the country's economies. Um, the government are rolling back some of these measures, um, including in Nigeria, Kenya, DRC, Ghana, um, in, in phases, um, but you know we can come to a, a bit more of, on that when we get to the question and answer. Finally, my, my final point is on the abusive enforcement of these measures. Um, security forces deployed, um, especially in countries with historically abusive forces, have been implicated in the use of excessive force to enforce the at home and social distancing orders. And in some cases, they have used these measures as a ploy for repression of political opposition and LGBT people. Um, for example, Ugandan forces detained for more than 50 days and accused 19 young people of flouting social distancing rules because they lived in a homeless shelter, um, having been rejected by their families for being LGBT. Um, fortunately, we wrote to the prosecutor in Uganda to drop these baseless charges, and uh, she did just that. She dropped the charges and the youths were released. Um, but we have also reported on the excessive use of force by police in, in Kenya, for example, killing, killing a 13-year-old boy in front of his own house, um, beating and tear gassing crowds of people on their way home from work for allegedly violating the curfew. Um, we've de documented similar reports of shooting and killing of people uh, perceived of uh, flouting restrictions in Rwanda, South Africa, and Nigeria. Uh, in, in Nigeria, the National Human Rights Commission, not, not even an in, in international organization like ours, reported that from beginning from the early days of the lockdown, security forces um, enforcing restrictions had killed more people than the disease itself had killed. And so we are, you know, as the African Commission on Human and People's Rights has done as well, um, urging governments to make human rights central in their responses, um, including by ensuring equitable access to healthcare, uh, protecting the most vulnerable groups and reframing from the excessive um, use of force in the enforcement of measures or otherwise abusing emergency powers, including uh, by using it as a pretext um, for targeting critics journalists, opposition politicians, as well as marginalized groups um, like migrants and LGBT. I will stop there. Um, I know I'm over time, but thank you. Thank you, Mosi, for also painting quite a bleak picture of uh, the human rights situation in uh, on the continent. You basically started by highlighting how uh, states are using emergency power to uh, curb uh, the spread of the virus, but by doing that, they also uh, uh, have an impact on the way uh, human rights are um, enforced. You talked about um, the the use of disinformation and misinformation, uh, the use of uh, excessive measures when it comes to containment, but also uh, when it comes to uh, migrants as well as uh, uh, other communities like uh, LGBT and the fact that uh, these communities are targeted did. Uh, the, you also mentioned the impact it has on uh, power and inequalities. And uh, finally, you ended uh, with uh, the statements about uh, how, uh, which is quite shocking, um, uh, measures for political repression have, have actually killed more uh, people than uh, the virus uh, itself. So here you highlighted a huge problem of uh, governance uh, across, uh, across Africa. Uh, maybe we'll have a better, more optimistic view, uh, turning now to uh, Ms. Susan Stegen, talking about uh, the economics. Susan, the mic is yours. Great. Thank you, Jean-Marc, um, and, and thanks to GCSP for hosting us. It's a pleasure to join this great panel. Um, I, 
I guess I, I'd like to focus a little bit on how, how do all of these different perspectives and realities start to add up in the medium to long term. And I think uh, many, many people are seized with the urgent and very important um, health risks. Uh, people are seized with the, the human rights aspects. People are seized with the immediate economic impacts. Um, and those are the right things to be focused on, uh, to be sure. Uh, I think there's also a need to be able to step back and think through what does this mean um, for peace um, and stability um, across Africa? Um, what does it mean for partners um, to Africa and Africans as, as we think about the, the effective response to, to the pandemic. Um, so I guess I wanted to start um, first by just underlining that, um, that there's, there is a success story that's taking place here. Um, and, and I'd focus less on, on the numbers in terms of cases um, for, for all of the reasons that people have already laid out, but, but highlight again that, that the African Union um, and the countries across the continent have forged a multilateral approach and response. Um, the, the platform that's, been come, that's come together to address supply chain needs, the joint efforts to look at questions of debt relief, um, the innovation and mobilization uh, that we've seen with, with artists um, and young people, uh, volunteers across the continent who are, who are seeking to educate in communities, who are seeking to set up um, better water sanitation opportunities where, where people don't necessarily have access to clean water. Um, and, and the way that, that I think consistently there's been lessons learned applied from uh, people have talked about before Ebola and other infectious diseases and also HIV AIDS. I mean, there, there have been moments across the continent where, pe where people have really had to consider what would be the impact of, of, a, of a massive um, pandemic. Um, and, and I think the other thing that's been really heartening is to see um, finance ministers um, and, and the, the group of, of special envoys start to engage in a, a really meaningful conversation about um, debt relief um, and about um, delays in terms of debt payments. Um, so I, I want to spend just a few minutes um, highlighting some of the economic impacts because I think I think it's um, everybody around the world is feeling some sort of economic impact um, due to the, the pandemic. Um, but I think we we don't necessarily appreciate how how hard that has hit. And we talk about them as second and third order effects. Um, I think that obscures that in many ways um, across the continent, this is probably the most immediate impact and the most significant impact. Um, so if we, we look at what the Economic Commission for Africa has, has examined to date, um, there's an expectation that, that the growth rate um, will slow from 3.2% to 1.8% in the best case scenario. Um, and there's an estimate that that will push close to 27 million people, uh, 27 million additional people into extreme poverty. Um, if we look a little bit at the labor market, um, the, the data tells us that 250 million Africans um, currently work in informal ur urban employment. And this is at particular risk um, during the lockdown and um, as, as countries take steps to, to curb um, the spread and transmission of the virus. Um, there have been estimates that up to 200 million jobs can be lost as, as a result of these, these economic impacts. And so we, we often think about these, these different impacts as being disconnected, or we talk about them in different silos. And part of our, our approach um, in, in thinking about peace is to recognize that, that fundamentally the way that, that societies are, can thrive, can be peaceful, can best live with each other, can, can withstand shocks, whether those are external or internal, is to have this, uh, to take this approach of resilience. Um, and, and a core feature of resilience is to have a, a, a sound relationship between the state and the society. Um, and that, that terminology doesn't resonate with everybody, um, but, but I think generally speaking, the, the sense of accountable govern, governance, the sense of inclusion, broadly speaking, the sense of trust that, that a government will deliver the fundamental services that the people need, um, health, roads, water, education, and security that 
protects citizens and that people can run towards when they need support, not security that is a threat to citizens. And I think as we, we look at the response to, to the pandemic, it's, it's really important to link these pieces together. Um, so, so maybe just as a, as a, a very concrete example, um, in, across the Horn of Africa, um, we've been spending quite a bit of our time thinking about the, the fragile transitions that are taking place in Ethiopia and, and in Sudan. Um, if we, we look at Ethiopia, um, the country has gone through a historic transition. Many have, have compared this to what happened in Europe in 1989 in terms of the, 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 the scale of the transition that's taking place. Um, Prime Minister Abiy, um, who won the Nobel Peace Prize and continues to play a leading role um, on the continent, um, has, has ushered in important reforms. Um, elections were meant to be held in August. Uh, those elections have now been postponed, a state of emergency put in place, um, and a decision made um, in the last week by the Constitutional Court inquiry to extend the, the term of the government um, to a time that is that elections would be held a year after it's determined that the pandemic is no longer a health threat. Um, in Sudan, uh, where a popular uprising removed uh, President Bashir uh, after 30, 30 years, um, resulted in this very fragile relationship between the security and the civilian elements. And one of the key instigators of the protests that sparked um, this change was the econ an economic crisis that was worsening. And so I think what we're, what we're seeing in Sudan um, is an example where the economic and the political come closely together. How, how can governments be able to respond to these primary needs and these primary demands of economic reform, of political reform towards accountable governance in the midst of a pandemic and in the midst of a, a worsening economic situation? And I think Ethiopia really highlights um, the, the dilemmas that will be faced by leaders at this moment, where there is a public health imperative to, to ensure that all steps are taken um, to protect and, and limit the spread of the virus. And at the same time, there's a, a, a push towards the, the continued political transition. Um, and I think it's in these types of moments that this idea of the politics of inclusion, of seeking a political settlement, of bringing in opposition, of civic groups, of those who are often left outside to be part of um, informing how, how these very difficult choices are made um, is, is particularly important. Um, so I guess just to, to, to wrap it up, um, as many people I'm sure are tracking, there are robust conversations with um, large financial packages from the international financial institutions, from the World Bank, from the IMF, um, and the various development banks. Um, there's also this conversation emerging about debt relief, um, and those are some of that debt relief is with the uh, international financial institutions, and some of it is bilateral in nature. And and what we've to, to bring these strands together, um, it's I think it's really critical that we. Uh, include and integrate a conversation about prevention and resilience in the design of those financial packages. Um, so if those financial packages continue to reinforce divisions in society, and whether those are some of the ones that Mousy set out or um, some of the more fundamental political um, divisions, um, then this is going to aggravate and, and make even further challenging um, the, the path towards peace um, across the continent. However, if it can be integrated in, this is an opportunity to really provide a platform and to spark um, a conversation that, that we see consistently in the public opinion research and we can hear consistently from our partners on the, on the continent that, that people want to reimagine that, that state society relationship. So that's a, that's a heavy agenda to carry forward in the midst of, of a very urgent situation um, and the, the, the complex, um, connection of the humanitarian crisis, the risk of, of food shortages and um, food insecurity, the, the locust invasion that's taking place across the Horn of Africa and all of these fragile transitions. Um, but I think it just begs for a very um, complex and dynamic approach to the response. Well, thank you. Thank you for starting first with a, uh, a success story. Uh, and I'd like to back to the discussion we had, uh, I think we'll be in episode 10, um, International Geneva and Multilateralism. Uh, you mentioned that Afri the African Union has, many, has managed to forge uh, a multilateral platform, which is, which is good, uh, good to, to know, because um, there, there was a lot of attack against uh, 
the multilateral, uh, global multilateral system. So it's good that out of this crisis, there are some uh, new initiatives coming up. But also you mentioned uh, the dire economic impact that this crisis is having with potentially 200 million people uh, losing their job. Uh, 27 million people, additional people, will be in extreme poverty. So frightening uh, uh, figures. And basically what you argued for is to rethink um, uh, financial package by including prevention and uh, and resilience and resilience in a sense that uh, there should be a healthy state society re uh, relationship that is based on accountability trust and uh, and and uh, and security uh, maybe we'll have more uh, beacon of hope with ralph uh, ralph Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jean-Marc, and, and thank you to all of the panelists. Uh, it is fantastic um, to be on a panel like this, to listen to you all, um, and uh, especially difficult to follow all of you now that um, so many uh, good points have been made. Um, I was, I was going to run through some of the, 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 the risks and negative consequences, but I think we've covered that um, quite comprehensively. So let me jump um, to what I see as some of the opportunities coming up. Um, uh, and I think there are opportunities here. And, you know, the risks and the opportunities both arise out of the fact that COVID, you know, in Africa and globally is really an accelerator of trends that are already in place. Um, it's difficult to talk about, uh, you know, uh, trend too broadly in Africa, even around food security. Um, you know, it has been uh, a good year for, for crops in South Africa and Zambia. And whereas the horn is facing a, a much more dire situation. Um, so the, the particular risks are gonna differ from place to place, um, but COVID will accelerate those risks. And I think that can go towards extremism um, in Northern Mozambique or in the Sahel. Um, it can go towards uh, corruption and transnational crime um, in, in other places, especially as resources become scarce. Um, that, is, that is often uh, uh, a result. Um, but let, let me talk about a few opportunities that I think we also have um, the, the potential to accelerate. Um, you know, th these won't be accelerated on their own. They will take um, decisions being made. Um, but first, um, let me start with the international community and, and some of, uh, you know, and the donor community. There is the potential for more immediate, more direct and more innovative interventions. Um, a lot of these have been discussed for some time. Um, they've been put on the tables, um, often formally. Um, but, you know, I think that there's been a degree of, of, um, of slowness in their implementation. Um, the UN has talked a lot about a triple nexus between humanitarian development and peace and security work. I think that COVID is exactly the kind of crisis that really calls for putting that into practice. Um, we have that, you know, I think it's as we've discussed here, we have an immediate humanitarian crisis. We have issues that are developmental in nature around health systems and, and the way they function. Um, and we have uh, the potential for um, peace and security impact as well. Um, so, you know, in, in looking, when donors look at, at what they're supporting, um, and they will be very important in all of this, um, that's gonna be uh, an important area um, to, to, to push forward because again, these ideas around um, around cash disbursement um, have been, you know, talked about for a long time, increasingly put into practice. Now the time is to accelerate them um, and 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 really make them, you know, the standard rather than the exception. Um, a second area uh, is. Um, making this a more localized uh, response um, and making sure community engagement is really at the forefront. Um, Dr. Nkenga Song mentioned the, um, their, the mobilization of uh, a million community health volunteers. I think that's precisely the kind of approach that's needed. Um, it was, I, I heard that um, UN agencies thus far have spent more money um, 
moving international personnel and international goods than on um, supporting local implementing partners. So it's, it's um, the symptom of an approach that's been, you know, longstanding um, and that we need to think seriously about changing, especially in a world where international travel um, becomes more difficult, more expensive, and potentially more risky for those that um, uh, the international community is trying to help. Um, and then I think to echo and really underline the point that Susan made around multilateralism. Um, you know, despite what uh, may be in the headlines or what you may infer from the headlines, uh, multilateralism is the future. Uh, those uh, countries that are able to leverage a multilateral response are going to be at a significant advantage. Uh, that goes for um, developed and powerful countries as well as the less developed and less powerful countries, but it applies especially uh, to the latter. Um, in, in a world that becomes uh, increasingly multipolar, um, the ability to have more nations uh, act with you and to, as, as um, the doctor mentioned, to collaborate, cooperate, and communicate uh, is incredibly important. And I think the African continent is well positioned for this. Um, they are very, pre you know, the African Union is one of the most well established regional organizations. Uh, I think uh, this goes on the, in the health sector as um, Dr. Nkengo Sung mentioned, as well as with things like the um, African Continental Free Trade Agreement um, you know, COVID can be an opportunity to strengthen some of those internal economic links. Um, currently, a great deal of African trade runs via Europe, uh, China, um, and, and other developed countries. Um, there is a significant opportunity for growth internally within the continent. Um, uh, that goes, you know, for flights, trade, um, a range of things. So I think for all of the, the challenges, and they are real that everyone has mentioned today, there's also some, some real opportunities here. Thank you. Thanks, Ralph. So uh, you brought some uh, positive uh, thinking in the sense that you, you have a, uh, you argue for a comprehensive and holis holistic view of all the different dimensions to be humanitarian, environmental health, uh, peace and security, and uh, basically highlight three factors that uh, uh, the international community uh, has responded in some areas very rapidly, and that is a rather good thing. Uh, the need for, uh, you know, although it's a global problem, the response should be local, more localized responses, and you end it with um, the call for uh, adopting multilateralism as a potential uh, comparative advantage uh, for uh, states who will uh, choose uh, that way. I think we had a, an excellent five uh, presentation, and I saw that the audience also responded quite well with that. Actually, it's the highest rate of question compared to uh, the numbers of uh, viewers. So I think we have more questions that uh, we'll have time to, to answer. So without further ado, I turn to, to Ashley for, for the Q&A round. Thank you very much, Sean Mark. And also thank you to the speakers. Um, I would just like to invite some of the, the speakers here on the screen to show that you are uh, available for a question, please. Thank you very much. And I would like to direct my first question to Dr. Kengesong, a question from Ambassador Yvette Stevens. Um, how does the African Union put, uh, put pressure on countries um, for example, as we've seen in Burundi, who are maybe not conforming to the continental response strategy. Thank you so much. So, no, thank you. That's, that's a very good question. I mean, as I indicated earlier, when the, when the continent perceived that we had a, a serious threat, uh, we all agreed as a continent to come together on February 22nd and uh, develop a, a strategy that we commit ourselves to. 
and all member states are signatories, all 55 member states are signatory to um, the, the treaty that uh, uh, brings all of us together as a, uh, the African Union Commission. And we expect that member states will uh, do what we've agreed on. And I think that there, there are direct discussions going on with uh, countries that are perceived like not uh, co coming through. And also, of course, uh, more diplomatic channels are used to in engaging um, the, the countries directly at the highest level. I think that is uh, for sure what the AU and, and, and the leadership is, is doing. So I think um, we're, uh, we recognize lastly that we have, um, as a continent, we have to win this fight together. That there will be local battles, but the overall victory has to be celebrated at the continental level because COVID infection, say in any country, Tanzania, Burundi, or Cameroon will be a COVID infection across the continent. There's absolutely no way that we'll see our trade uh, 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 flourish the way it was uh, intracontinental intra trade flourish the way it was before um, the, the COVID uh, uh, arrived if we do not cooperate and, and work together then. Ethiopian Airlines used to be all over uh, the continent, was the pride of the continent, the largest airline and serving every corner of the, of the continent. Now, if you, uh, you so you cannot imagine uh, only Ethiopia eliminating COVID. I mean, it has to be all over the continent so that we can enjoy the, 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 the liberty of growth that we had before. So I think all of that is a combination of things to say that the continental free trade agreement is enough pressure to put on everybody, each member state to say, look, I have to uh, uh, coordinate and cooperate. Uh, the signatory to the African Union ch uh, Charter is, is uh, a strong force to, um, to for countries to take their responsibilities and of course the overall interconnectivity that we recognize that bind all of us together. I think that with all of that and then the formal pressures and informal pressures are all things we are using to make sure that countries uh, cooperate. Thank you very much doctor for your answer. Um, my next question is directed to uh, Dr. Rufikiri. If you may please, uh, there was a comment that there seems to be a disconnect between top-down efforts of the government, multilateral institutions and local communities. So how might that disconnect be bridged and how to address uh, mistrust from local communities with governments? Thank you. Ah, this is a hard question. Uh, in uh, some uh, government, uh, a leading system such as in Burundi or in other uh, countries uh, known as a dictatorship, it's very difficult. Uh, the information I, I gave about this images to declare persona non grata this uh, workers of WHO, uh, there is no solution about, but maybe international community could continue to use diplomatic means to see if it can be improvement in the relations, but uh, it is very tough, it's very tough. And also uh, in the, such a condition, uh, conditions, uh, local communities uh, are also in a bad situation because uh, they can't uh, uh, talk, they can't uh, report, uh, because there are many restrictions, uh, it's very, very difficult. Very difficult, I could say that. According to what is observed in, in Burundi, uh, it's very difficult. Even today, uh, the new president was uh, sworn in and uh, there was a crowd uh, gathering uh, while people are dying of COVID and no measures for uh, uh, protection of the population was uh, really taken. It is said everybody, but uh, no real uh, enforcement. It's, it's a very difficult situation. Thank you very much for your answer. Uh, my next question is directed to Ms. Segun. Um, there's a comment on the an intersection between immediate human rights considerations as you've mentioned right now with the COVID pandemic and the balance with the long-term considerations. 
um, in building a healthy, stable government. This one particularly uh, asking in the context of South Sudan. Um, however, perhaps it could be applicable in, in, in certain other areas as well. Um, I'm going to just give this a shot. I'm not, I'm not sure I totally understand the question. But yeah, um, there's always a tension between, you know, um, what are the immediate um, pressing human rights issues um, and the, the, the need to invest, you know, um, if, for example, in issues of um, peace and security rather than just dealing with, uh, um, in, the, in the case of South Sudan, the, the issues of abduction um, of, of women and girls or the, the, the recruitment of, of children um, or even, you know, providing um, enough treatment and isolation centers to, to um, address the COVID situation. Um, government does not have, you know, finite um, resources. Um, so it is a balancing. There is a, a need to be balanced um, and it is, it requires, you know, continuous analysis. And I think it, it, a lot of the time it just requires honesty. Honesty and openness on the part of the government on what they are doing. There must be um, clear, concerted efforts to address the immediate situation within the resources available or just admitting that the resources, resources aren't available and asking for help for wherever they, they, they exist um, from the international community or elsewhere. Um, again, civil society is key and this is a key partner. Um, it's important that the government um, ensure that they, you know, they keep them abreast, include them in, 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 you know, in consultation, in decision making. Um, and then uh, the investment for the future is, is, is most important, especially in times like this. Um, we've heard from the different speakers um, about the dire economic situation um, that Africa um, is going to face in the next couple of years. Um, it's important that the the government pays attention to economic and social rights issues, education, health. Um, the, 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 the challenge of the, the responding to COVID um, has been worsened by the lack of healthcare infrastructure. How does the government attend to that without, you know, taking away from the immediate situation of responding to the virus as it is today? What can they do um, in, in the long term? And, you know, it's really, it's, it's, a, it's a balancing act. Um, but I think honesty and openness on the part of the government would be key. Thank you very much for your answer. My next question directed to Ms. Stijan. Um, may I ask, uh, what is your opinion on, um, is there an opportunity for Africa to lead the way forward perhaps um, as Europe and the rest of the world scramble? Um, where can uh, Africa rise to the occasion perhaps? So I, think, I think it's a great question. It's always it's always so encouraging to hear questions framed in a, in a positive way. Um, so I, I think um, as people have talked about, there are some really strong examples of where um, African countries have mobilized existing community health infrastructure in a way that that hasn't happened effectively um, in the United States, hasn't happened um, in in most cases across Europe. Um, and I think that's that's something to really look towards. Um, I think in the same way, the type of innovation that's happened on a technological basis and on developing testing, I think is, is also something to look at. Um, it's, it strikes me that um, in the first few months of in the response to the pandemic, there was a, a, a discussion, a really important discussion about whether the approaches of containment taken um, in Europe and in um, the United United States um, and Canada, would, would that fit um, given the social, cultural, political, economic realities um, and the way that, that people live um, across the continent in Africa? And I think that's, that's a really, really important um, discussion. I mean, I, I think what I'd say maybe to dovetail with the last question is my hope is um, that that the response to the pandemic, the, the multilateral cooperation that's happening across um, the African Union is a way to also um, spark some really important discussions that need to happen. So as we've said, it's great that the African Union is leading um, and that there is a multilateral response. Um, the borders don't end at the end of the continent. Um, and so part of what we've been looking at is the increased interconnection between the Gulf countries and the Horn of Africa and how that impacts on peace and security it also impacts directly on health. Um, and so I think hopefully this will force us into a conversation about our interconnectedness um, and the realities that, that what happens 
anywhere in the world impacts the, the safety, security, um, prosperity, um, and peace for all of us. Thank you very much. And uh, Ralph, uh, Mr. Mamia, my next question goes to you. Um, some of the world is experiencing a second wave of the COVID-19 pandemic already as Africa is in its first wave. Uh, do you think there could be a better focus on preventing the second wave by responding better to the first wave? Uh, over to you. Uh, <laughs> it, uh, yes and no. So I think that, um, uh, you know, we haven't really seen the second wave yet. Um, any, and there, there, uh, the Europe is, and, and the US are, some countries are experiencing and then parts of Asia are resurgence of cases, but I think this isn't really the second wave um, that some epidemiologists feared and continue to fear, which is really probably coming in the winter and fall. Um, uh, you know, when in the Northern Hemisphere, temperatures will drop, people will be more inside and the virus will have had time to mutate. Um, so that, that's, that's the big concern. Uh, now, that being said, uh, that is certainly going to be uh, in, impact Africa as well. Um, I don't think that, um, you know, any of this is over. Um, and, and, you know, in thinking about uh, the risks and the impact, um, that is absolutely something to keep in mind. That uh, whether it is uh, measures around lockdown or economic impacts, um, re reductions in global trade, um, uh, those, those trends are all with us for, you know, at least another year. Um, you know, with, with the vaccine, hopefully we, we see some, some positive change, but a, a lot of those negative consequences are not going away uh, soon. Thank you very much. Um, I will group the next uh, round of questions. And for those of you who would like to answer to them, please feel free. Um, there is a, a, a question on how many African countries are participating in research towards a vaccine? Uh, my question to the panelists, does anyone want to take a stab at that question? Okay. Uh, maybe uh, Dr. Nkasong would be in a good position to answer. Are you still there, Dr. Nkasong? Uh, Ashley, maybe it's... I will go on to the next one. Oh, yes, hello. <laughs> hello. Yes, yes. How are you? Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, very, very, very few countries uh, participating in vaccine trials for now. I think next week we have a big meeting on the 24th and 25th to discuss vaccine frameworks on the continent. So very few countries are, are, are doing vaccine trials now. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your answer on that. Um, another question is, uh, what do you think is, a, is driving the anti-vaccine movements on African continent? Um, maybe Ms. Segun, would you like to uh, answer that question, please? Oh, um, well, this is a little bit outside of my my area, um, but I, I think sorry, that again? it was sorry to oh, miss. Sorry, sorry. You. I apologize. Thank you. <laughs> I'll try well, to do one sound similar. Yeah, I mean, I some of it is historical, and um, it's it's just it's founded on mistrust of government and uh, government intentions and motivations. Um, we've seen um, in cases in, in the case of Ebola, for example, in, in, in West Africa, both in West Africa, and in um, in the DRC, um, how the use of security forces um, in one tran transporting and, you know, up, um, um, supplying um, vaccines, um, you know, have been met with resistance and violence from locals because they do not trust security forces. And so, you know, these, these, these are some of the lessons that should be learned from the way we've handled um, some of these um, outbreaks in the past. Um, one, it is to build that trust with the community, um, education, um, information, communication uh, very clearly and articulately 
aren't involving the, the communities, um, the local people um, in the resolution, in the provision of, you know, whatever resources government is bringing, bringing um, in is really, would re be really key um, in be rebuilding that trust and ensuring that people um, understand um, what the vaccines are for, um, why it is being used in their region. They are not not being tested. There's a lot of misinformation um, in the media as well. You know, so government has to proactively um, tackle um, all of those um, um, information out there. Thank you very much for your answer, um, Dr. Rafikiri. I will come to you on this question. Um, several African countries have begun to uh, ease their lockdown or in phases due to what has been seen perhaps as impracticality of social distancing measures in, in some societies. Um, how do you think that is going to um, affect? Do you think that it will, if I may just ask that question to you, uh, what, is, what are your thoughts? Will there be herd immunity? Will it spread faster? Um, it, what do you think? Yes, um, a full, a strict uh, lockdown. Wait, 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 put my, my microphone. Yeah, um, a very strict lockdown in Africa is uh, not sustainable because most of uh, people uh, rely on day uh, day. Uh, earning of uh, something to buy food and so on. So it is difficult because uh, people will say uh, by COVID I will die, by hunger I will die, so uh, give me peace. Uh, but there are some countries who took uh, measures to ease the lockdown uh, with the, also a sort of uh, distancing, particularly by obligation for uh, uh, wearing mask, masks. This can help to avoid the speed of uh, uh, the pandemic uh, while uh, regular activities are performed are continued. This uh, but, uh, the is difficult, and where the, there is no other measures such as the wearing of uh, local masks, uh, it will be a problem for spread of uh, the pandemic. Thank you. I will uh, defer to another question for, for, uh, for Ms. Stijant from uh, Jean-Marc Rickley. Yeah, uh, Susan, you mentioned uh, the interconnection between uh, what happens in the Horn of Africa and the Middle East, the, the Gulf state, especially if I think you were referring to what happens in, uh, in Somalia, uh, Eritrea, Ethiopia. Uh, could you please develop a bit more this this point? Because I think it's very important uh, to, to to highlight how uh, geopolitical uh, objectives could have also have uh, an impact on the way we deal with, with this crisis. Well, I think um, over the last couple of years, there's been increased in attention at. Um, what is probably an intensification of the political um, and security engagement of some of the Gulf countries in the Horn of Africa. And as you said, we've we've seen this in Somalia, um, it's seen in Djibouti, um, in, it's seen prim in, very visibly in terms of the discussions about the ports and who controls the ports up and down the, the coast of the Red Sea. Um, but I think that it goes beyond the ports. Um, this is, it's not just, you know, people don't live in the sea, the sea is the bridge to land, um, and the land is where people live and where where these, these potential um, tensions and conflicts play out. Um, we've also seen this in, in Sudan and in Ethiopia in very robust ways um, in Sudan where um, the, the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia have been closely engaged in the transition and working closely with partners in, in the US, the UK and, and Europe uh, to, to support that transition process. Um, over the last few years though, there's also been a, an intensification of a discussion to say, how 
how can you bridge from a multilateral perspective across the Red Sea? On the Horn of Africa side, you have the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, you have the African Union. On the Gulf side, there's the League of Arab States, there's the Gulf Cooperation Council. Um, but there's nothing, there's no plumbing that connects those two together. Um, and so there's been a discussion about what are shared interests. And there's been, I think, really exciting ideas around the blue economy um, as a shared space. Um, there are obviously geopolitical interests with the Red Sea and the Baba Mandeb, where you know, $700 billion of trade passes through each year. So this matters for, for all of us um, in, in the broader trade perspective. And I think today, there's an opportunity to really reinvigorate those conversations um, when you see that the amount of movement of people, um, whether that's forced migration in some cases or whether it's voluntary um, migration between the Horn and the Gulf, um, when you see the interconnectedness um, of what a response will need to look like. Um, and I think it, historically, we've seen that, that health crises are really a, a moment where people can come together and there's this imperative for cooperation. So my, my greatest hope is that this will actually animate further a discussion um, about how, how some of these shared challenges um, can be addressed. What is the architecture um, from a multilateral perspective that's needed to bridge, bridge across the Red Sea? Thank you very much. Uh, actually, my next question to, and, and my final question is to Mr. Pamia. Um, you, you did emphasize the importance of multilateralism. Um, are you seeing that as across the continent, um, regionally, or as we know, uh, China with the Belt and Road Initiative throughout the, the continent as well, um, or with Europe? Where do you see the, the, the main focus being in the immediate COVID-19 pandemic? Um, well, certainly at the at the level of the continent, um, and I, I think uh, that um, you know everything we've heard today speaks to that. Um, but more broadly, and you know, and that is where I'm sort of looking with all of this. I think that you know the experience that African countries have with multilateral engagement um, prepares them really well. Um, it is it is an instinct that that many of them have. Um, uh, I think to a greater degree than many other countries or many other regions of the world. Um, and, and that's going to serve them well um, coming up, uh, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the medium to long term, um, I think. Because again, you know, COVID is accelerating things. And, uh, you know, the, we, we would have gone through a rough patch um, of multi, we will go through a rough patch of multilateralism, at least within the United Nations. Um, I think that's, that's clear to most people with, with deadlock on the Security Council. Um, but there will come a realization that that multilateral approach is actually necessary. And those countries that are able to muster uh, other nations behind them um, are, are going to do much better. And that goes, that goes in everything from, the kinds of politics debated in the Security Council to trade, um, to, to security agreements, to all sorts of things. Um, and some countries may recognize that more quickly than others, uh, but I think, you know, Africa is already well along down uh, uh, on that road. Um, and so, uh, yeah, and, 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 you know, the, the architecture of their, re of their sub-regional organizations is, is also a source of strength. Um, whether it's it's ECOWAS or EGAD or um, uh, yeah, uh, so I, the, the short answer is all of it. Um, but but certainly I think as we've heard today, uh, the the continent wide um, uh, approach to COVID through the AU um, and you know the the creation of that platform um, for assistance from China and from other countries is something that uh, that, that we don't see other places. Well, I thank you to, to all of you for, for your uh, brilliant uh, insight as well as uh, uh, enlightening us about uh, these different issues. Um, this uh, episode concludes our series I mentioned earlier. Uh, we've been running this uh, webinar series for 12 uh, weeks now. Uh, we covered uh, very different topics from regional issues to more topical issues. And um, after... Uh, 
these 12 uh, episodes, uh, there were some commonalities in the sense that uh, these episodes showed that there are some risks out there that have been, as Ralph mentioned, accelerated by um, this crisis. They could be, obviously the first one are health uh, issues, um, the uh, imbalance between uh, those who have and those who have not uh, will be increased. Uh, the impact, uh, the economic impact on poverty, especially people falling into extreme poverty will uh, grow. The political uh, risk link to uh, straightening uh, government that are authoritarian or using uh, this crisis to increase the uh, repression, obviously impact on the environment uh, was mentioned uh, across pretty, pretty much all the, the um, uh, the episode and the role of technology. Uh, for good purposes, technology as an enabler to uh, give access to people to resources they wouldn't have, but also the misuses in terms of uh, disinformation, in terms of increasing repression. And all these episodes have shown that uh, the, this crisis uh, highlights the need for more global cooperation, uh, more multilateral uh, approaches, and also uh, what was mentioned again today is uh, the need for uh, building more resilient systems that are based on uh, adapting a um, comprehensive approach, holistic approach, and not just focusing on uh, specific issues. Um, this has been a really interesting journey for uh, run across this 12 episode. Uh, before I conclude this series, I would like to really thank uh, the people that uh, were behind at first, Ashley, that you saw on a weekly uh, basic uh, basis that has um, play an important role uh, for obviously asking questions, but those who do, you do not have, uh, you haven't seen, Corinne, uh, Jean, uh, Laura, Marilor, and Christians. So I would like to, to thank all of them because without them, uh, we wouldn't have been able to provide you with this uh, uh, webinar series. We'll probably uh, leave it for, for, for now. There will be probably other um, uh, webinar series by the GCSP. If you want to uh, watch previous episodes, you can basically uh, look on our uh, um, YouTube channel and uh, you'll, see, you'll be able to see all of the episodes. Also, don't forget to sign up to our uh, YouTube channel so you get all the uh, latest about uh, our activities and also check out our website, gcsp.ch. Once again, thank you for all the, the speakers today for their contribution from um, uh, the United States to uh, Africa and, uh, and Europe. And until uh, next time, I uh, wish uh, you all the best, stay safe, and uh, we'll reconnect in the future. Thank you very much. <laughs>